Hi, my name is Roger, and I'm a pharmacist by training based in Toronto, Canada. Today, I'd like to share with you some information about clinical trials for COVID-19 drug treatments. And uh, when we look at the activity that is going on in terms of COVID-19 drug treatment clinical trials, it really seems like we're throwing the kitchen sink at COVID-19. And I hope in the near future, we will be able to find a treatment that is both safe and effective. So an outline for this presentation, First, I'm going to talk about uh, the intent of this presentation, why I'm doing this. Then next, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, as well as its process of infection. And by going through the different steps on which the virus infects us, hopefully it would also provide some clues for potential treatment targets. Next, we're going to talk about the COVID-19 drug treatments that are currently being tested in clinical trials. I'll first outline my approach in doing this, and then we're going to talk about the drug treatments themselves, following the targets along the different steps of the process of infection. Next, we're going to, we're going to talk about the famous, or shall we say, the infamous trial um, of uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. So I'll provide you with some information about this trial, which has garnered uh, quite a bit of media attention. And finally, we'll conclude. So first, intent of this presentation. Well, this presentation is not intended to show what works for COVID-19 because nothing has clearly been shown to work at this point, uh, at least as of um, the 16th of April, 2020. Uh, nothing has been shown, uh, uh, clearly been shown to work at this point. Uh, I do hope that we will know soon and things change uh, very quickly as well. So um, like uh, the information might, might, uh, might get up outdated as well. So what is the intent then? Well, the intent is to provide information on the different treatment uh, uh, for different types of drug treatments that are currently being tested for COVID-19 and also the rationale for being tested. Uh, we're also, hopefully, hopefully it would provide you with a proper background and framework to continue to follow the progress of clinical trials so that later on, maybe they, they found something that works, you, you know, oh, that is a, a protease inhibitor, for, for example. Or you will know um, if there is a new drug treatment, you will also know like uh, uh, in, in the context of all the treatments that are being tested, where it belongs to. And finally, I really hope that this could spark your interest in the different drug treatments that are being tested for COVID-19 and invite you to participate in the quest to find treatments for COVID-19 and monitor its impact in our healthcare system. So now let's talk about the anatomy of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and its process of infection. And maybe we could find some clues for treatment targets as well. So this is what the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. As you could see, as with a lot of other uh, viruses, this is basically a genetic material in the center and then an outer capsule uh, out there. So SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, which means that the genetic material in the middle, in, in the center, is RNA. There are other viruses such as DNA viruses or retroviruses, but uh, you could also see that it is being encapsulated by an outer shell. Note that there are many protein components in addition to the genetic material. As you can see, like there's spike protein, there are membrane protein, there are the uh, capsid. Um, these are the different protein component um, that also makes up the virus in addition to the genetic material. And that is important as we talk about uh, later some of the targets to target uh, viral replication. So bear this in mind uh, that there are a lot of protein uh, components as well. So now let's talk about how does it infect us? And I suppose the very first step is that uh, a person has to be in contact with the virus. So this unfortunate uh, gentleman here, um, he was near to another person when he sneezed. And so like the, he was exposed uh, to COVID-19 virus. So once it's exposed, the COVID-19 virus will enter our bloodstream and then uh, when it is in our bloodstream, it tries to enter our cells. And there are different uh, uh, pathways or tunnels that the virus could enter our cells that we're going to talk about later. Once it enters our cells, then it basically acts like a bunch of criminal that uh, goes to a factory, hijacks the, 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 the factory and, and say, 
well, don't make your your uh, your, your the, the things that you guys are usually making. Make our stuff instead. So basically, uh, the virus will use our cellular mechanism um, to make more virus um, uh, for for itself. So first, it would replicate many copies of its own RNA or its genetic material, and then those RNA will tell the cell to make viral proteins. It would uh, it would provide instructions and um, it would halt the, the cell's normal function, but then the cell will now switch to providing viral proteins in, in itself uh, in, instead. And then once you have the uh, replicated RNA and you also have a lot of the viral protein components that are being made, the, the viral protein uh, first comes in a long chain and then it is being cut up to its uh, relevant uh, components there and then assemble and now you have a new virus here like a, in fact many many virus are being uh, made in, in the cell this way and once uh, uh, there's a lot of viruses they burst out of the cell and then those viruses are now available to infect other cells now interestingly enough um, studies have shown that the virus themselves um, cause the infection but it might not necessarily be the, um, the, the, the thing that causes the serious outcome, the ICU admission and things like that. In fact, it could be that it is our body's overwhelming and disproportionate immune response. Um, we call it a cytokine storm that is causing the, 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 the lung inflammation, the, uh, the, the fluid in the lungs and the breathing difficulties necessitating like um, uh, the, uh, the ventilator or ICU. So like, uh, and then like, uh, uh, that's what happens. Uh, the patient is, is now in ICU requiring ventilating support. So I think this is the process from which the COVID-19 um, uh, disease um, uh, 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 pro progresses with its infection and, um, and leading to uh, potentially severe outcomes. So, if we think about this process, we could also think about how we could counteract each of these steps. For example, we can first prevent the virus from getting into our body, right? Uh, that is the first step. And uh, there are a lot of things that we're already doing, for example, social distancing or wearing masks. These are measures that basically seek to prevent you from being exposed to the virus altogether. And uh, certainly, like uh, these are effective measures. Now, once it gets into your body and it's floating in your bloodstream, for example, you can try to eliminate it right there. And there are interventions that are targeted at that that we're, we're going to talk about uh, later. Well, if that doesn't work, well, you could stop it from entering your cells. And if that is the case, it can't replicate. Um, if that didn't work and it enters your cells, then you could stop the virus from re replicating and there are treatments uh, targeted at this step as well. Once it replicates, you could hopefully prevent it from triggering a cytokine storm, uh, which is um, uh, causing the se severe outcomes. Um, once a cytokine storm is being triggered, I suppose you could then try to protect your body uh, your lungs or your heart, for example, from the damage or if the damage is already done to try to treat that damage. But as you, as you could see, we're getting more and more desperate here. And if all fails, we wanted to try to keep the patient alive using ventilators, uh, life support, um, uh, things like that. Um, so like all, there are treatments targeted at all these different steps. For the rest of the presentation, we will focus on the middle, uh, the five steps in the middle. Um, the, uh, the preventing virus from getting into our body is very important, as well as the uh, life support measures at the end as well. Um, but then it will be out of scope for the, uh, for the rest of the presentation because these do not uh, usually involve drug treatments. So let's talk about the middle five steps. And uh, let's move on to SARS-CoV-2 drug treatments currently being tested in clinical trials. First, let me uh, share with you my approach to doing this. Um, I really wanted to be complete and talk about all the treatments that are currently being tested. And so what I did is I used the data extract from clinicaltrials.gov from the U.S. National Library of Medicine. This is the largest clinical trial registry that covers a large number of the clinical trials that are being uh, conducted in this world. 
So like I used the data extract um, and uh, the latest uh, extracts that I pulled is the April the 16th abstract. So uh, the information in this presentation is updated as of um, April the 16th. I examined all of the drug treatments that are being evaluated in the clinical trials to date by reading through those data abstracts and, um, and basically categorized them or mapped them into the potential treatment targets or the treatment targets along the process of infection, which uh, we just talked about, the five uh, steps in the middle. So this is what the data abstract look like. And um, um, I've added several columns to categorize uh, each and uh, each and every one of these uh, treatments uh, that are being tested in clinical trials. So, for example, like antiviral, anti-inflammatory, so on and so forth. Um, just wanted to share the number of clinical trials that are that are being conducted at this point. Um, the numbers are basically rising very quickly. There's an explosion of clinical trials for uh, for COVID-19 treatments. So, for example, I started uh, doing this in April the 2nd, and there are 282 trials for COVID-19 treatments. And then in April the 7th, in April the 7th, it uh, the name, number rise to 366. So I told myself, well, I better update this. And then Two days later, like uh, it is already 410 trials, and now in April the 16th, uh, it is 621 trials. So, like um, I thought, oh, okay, I need to update myself every time. I I thought I'm I'm up to date. Um, like there are many uh, more trials that are being started, and again, like uh, hopefully this is a promising sign that we will be able to find something that will be safe and effective. Now, let's. Let's present these uh, different treatments that are currently being tested, again, along the steps of the viral infection. So let's recap. Um, once the virus gets into our body, we could try to eliminate it and inactivate it. That's one step. The next step is that if it doesn't work, you could stop it from entering your cells. Once it enters your cells, you could stop it from replicating. Once it replicates, you could prevent it from triggering a cytokine storm, um, that, uh, that severe, um, that uh, overwhelming immune response that leads to the, uh, the serious outcomes. And finally, once a cytokine storm has been triggered, you could try to protect your body, uh, in particular the lungs and the heart, from the damage, or if the damage is already done, to treat that damage. So let's talk about the first step. How do you eliminate or inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus before it even gets into your cells. Well, you do this by antibodies. You do, do this by immunity. Um, so we have uh, two types of uh, approach in this step. The first one is active immunity, and that's vaccination. Basically, to give vaccine so that your body could see like, a, like an antigen or, or something um, that uh, a fragment of the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus so that your body could gear up, produce antibody uh, to it and be able to resist the, uh, the, the, the virus or inactivate the virus. The, the antibody sticks to the virus itself, inactivating it. And as you could see, there are many vi uh, vaccine candidates that are currently being tested right now. Well, that is not the only way to eliminate the virus before it gets into our cell. A second way to do it is, um, is just to give you the antibodies. Like the, the first one uh, for a vaccine, it teaches your body um, how to make antibodies towards the virus. But you could just provide the antibodies themselves, and that is called passive immunity. Your body really isn't involved in producing the antibodies they were given to you. So what you do is you take plasma from patients who have already been uh, who were infected uh, by COVID-19 and now has gotten well so that they have antibodies. And then if you take their, their, their plasma, uh, it's a blood product, and, uh, in, and give it to a patient who is currently suffering from COVID-19, then you're in, uh, essentially giving them the antibody to fight the, the infection. So like um, there is the, the benefit of um, the body doesn't really need the vaccine, like uh, they could get the antibody right away. Uh, but the downside is that your body really doesn't, still doesn't know how to make the antibodies. Um, so that, um, like, uh, if the patient is infected again, um, then the patient will still be susceptible. The patient will not be immune to COVID nineteen. So that's the first step. Now let's talk about the next step, which is preventing SARS CoV two cell entry. Just basically, don't want the virus from entering our cells. 
and uh, there are a number of uh, potential pathways or tunnels that the SARS-CoV-2 virus would enter our cell. And interestingly enough, one of those are the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or the ACE2. So if you are um, if you're familiar with ph pharmacology or, or medication, you would know that the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is a common target for blood pressure medications. There are ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers that, uh, that are for blood, uh, high blood pressure. And so there are, me there are clinical trials that test um, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, for example, Losartan, Valsartan for COVID-19, basically trying to use these blockers to block the receptor it's so that it's already occupied when the virus comes along and the virus have no receptor to enter the uh, into the cell and so there are trials uh, looking at that as well but then there but our body sometimes does interesting things and um, when a receptor is blocked sometimes it would try to upregulate that receptor what happens is that a, the, the the body would sense hey how come all my receptors are being blocked here let me produce more of that receptor so that it, more receptors will become available and uh, if that is the case then maybe blocking the receptor isn't such a good idea because it might uh, trigger that upregulation of the uh, uh, of the receptor and then we now have basically caused the body to produce more tunnels for the cell uh, for for the for the virus to go in so in that along that line of, of thinking there are also another group of trials that are seeking to discontinue ACE inhibitor for patients who are already on it who are suffering from COVID-19 uh, infection so do you block that or do you unblock it nobody knows at this time and I hope that uh, we'll soon find out uh, with the clinical trials being uh, be being testing uh, being ongoing now other potential uh, cell entry uh, points would be the CD147 receptor. Um, the medication melplazumab is an anti-CD147 antibody and that um, is being tested as well. Uh, there's also the AP2 associated uh, protein kinase 1 which is uh, the AAK1. Uh, um, that could also be an entry point for the, uh, for the virus. So baricitinib is an AAK1 inhibitor. So these are some of the medications that are currently tested, which seek to block the virus uh, entering the cell. Now let's go to step three. Step three is stopping the virus from re replicating. If the, if the virus is already in the cell, let's stop it from replicating. The first way that you could stop it from replicating is by inhib inhibition of the RNA polymerase. Now, like uh, the RNA, it's basically a long chain of molecules uh, uh, a long chain molecule with a lot of building blocks in it and the building blocks could be one of the four types basically like uh like one after another one building block after another and those building blocks are only from four types of, uh, of building blocks that is a very similar situation as a lego tower where each block could only be one of four colors for example that's a that's an analogy and just by the same um, idea that you need a kid to, to build the Lego uh, t tower to stack more and more building blocks on top of the, of the tower, the RNA, uh, growing RNA chain requires RNA polymerase to, um, to, to find more and more building blocks to attach it to its end. So in that situation here, um, the kid here is like the RNA polymerase. Um, that helps prolong the tower, to helps build the chain there. And so we could inhibit uh, this, this RNA polymerase, kind of like uh, telling the kid to go away and, uh, and taking the kid out of the equation so that uh, nobody will be building the, the Lego tower. And that would be the same for RNA uh, polymerase when, when you inhibit it. And a uh, medication uh, that does that is uh, favipiravir. This is a medication that is currently undergoing a, a lot of uh, clinical trials and shows some promise uh, as well. Uh, it inhibits the RNA polymerase. And once you inhibit that, then no more virus replication could happen. Another way that you could uh, stop the virus from replicating, and I, and I think this is a rather subversive way, at least to the virus standpoint, is uh, by using nucleoside analog. And there are uh, some medications which are like that. So for example, Randisivir, it is an adenosine analog, and ribavirin, it is a guanosine analog. So these drugs look like the building blocks, but they're not 
they're not exactly the building blocks. They 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 doesn't they don't do the same thing. So imagine this uh, this Lego chain here. Um, it is being built up, and so the next step would be to take this red block and, and incorporating it here, right? The only problem is this is not a real Lego block. It it looks like a, a Lego block, and that's why like uh, um, uh, it is uh, prone to being uh, put in here to, to attach it. But unlike a, a regular Lego block, where if you look on the back side, it, there is these uh, this structure which you could attach more and more Lego blocks to it. It, it doesn't look like that. The Rendezvous or Rabbivarian, um these nucleus nucleoside analog looks like looks like this perhaps. Like it is all solid, all flat. Once this is being plugged in no further uh, building could happen and the chain just stops there and uh, if that is the case then um, then replication also stops right there so uh, imagine like your cell like with bucket loads of these nucleoside analogs floating there chances are high that one of these um, uh, analogs would be mistakenly like uh, put in there and that would be the end of the um, the replication and um, and that would be a, a good outcome for from the human perspective. Now, a third way to stop the virus from replicating once it's entered our cell is uh, is by what we call protease inhibitors. Like what happens is that uh, if you remember, like I, I mentioned earlier, that the viral replication involves the replication of the genetic material, but also the protein component as well. So the virus has to like make the protein components the RNA will tell the cell how to do it and what happens will be a long chain of amino acid long chain of protein with all the protein components uh, in it but it has to be cut up and um, it is being cut up by the enzyme protease in here like uh, you see the long chain in here containing all the necessary components here that uh, when it's cut up it could uh, then um, become individual components those are being assembled and now you have a new virus but then um, protease inhibitor for example lopinavir or, um, or, or Kalitra um, these medications try to take the protease out of the equation they inhibit it and so the virus cannot cut the, the, the protein and so now you have this long chain and they don't know what to do with it the analogous situation is that um, uh, if you have experience building a model car then you have seen this basically all your components here um, being packed within a plastic frame here and what we have to do is we have to remove all these pieces from the frame so that we have all the components to, um, to to build our model car so we need a knife to cut it out and basically protease inhibitor is like uh, taking away the knife so that now you're, you're you're stuck with this this big frame with all the components and then you don't you can't build your car so that's what protease inhibitor does, and it also stops the virus from replicating. There are also other ways to stop the virus from replicating. For example, upset it, upsetting the optimal conditions for replication. And that's what hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine does. It uh, alkalinizes the phag phagolysosome, and it affects the low pH de uh, dependent steps of viral replication including fusion and uncoating. There are several steps in the viral replication where they need an acidic environment or low pH environment. And hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, they raise the pH, making it more alkalinized, uh, alkaline or, uh, or, or more basic. And uh, if that is the case, uh, then vi viral replication will not happen in the optimal conditions. So that's also another pathway to, to stop virus from replicating. And then um, there are also other mechanisms as well. Um, medications like interferon, azithromycin, natural honey, they are considered to have antiviral uh, properties as well, um, according to uh, via different mechanisms. So now let's talk about our fourth step, which is that if the virus successfully replicates itself, what do we do? Well, we prevent it from triggering the cytokine storm which is associated with severe outcomes so like uh, in here we're talking about immunomodulation or suppressing the uh, the the immune system at least in the drugs that are in this page uh, um, it, it seeks to suppress the immune system so that the cytokine storm does not happen that overwhelming immune response does not happen and you see medications uh, such as uh, ferulimab um, tocilizumab tofacitinib 
and um, these are uh, uh, these are the immuno immunomodulation medications. You also see uh, corticosteroids. You see uh, innovative therapies such as uh, stem cell uh, therapy, um, even uh, fluvoxamine and antidepressants has been shown to uh, to to suppress the cytokine storm. So that also has been tested. Uh, colchicine, uh, same idea. You, you see a lot of medication being tested in this area, trying to uh, prevent this cytokine storm. When we're talking about uh, immunomodulation, there's another school of thought that says we need to stimulate the in immune system instead of, uh, instead of uh, suppressing it. So there are also like medications which stimulate the, uh, the immune system. Sargamostim, uh, for example, this is a colony stimulating factor um, that uh, stimulates the immune system. Um, Levenazole, uh, is also an immunostimulator uh, as well. Um, uh, the idea uh, for this trial is that we will stimulate the immune system in all parts of the body systemically, but then uh, we will suppress the immune system by giving steroid inhaler in the lung. And so that's also like a, um, a, a, the, the rationale behind one trial as well. So as, as we see, we don't even, we don't really know whether we should suppress or we should stimulate the immune system. And there are trials of both types going on at the same time. There are also nutritional supplements that are um, being tested as well. Um, 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 Omega-3 fatty acid supplements, uh, vitamin C uh, supplements, uh, vitamin D supplements, very high doses uh, uh, of those, uh, by the way. Um, that are being tested, and also traditional Chinese medicine being tested for its uh, immunomodulation uh, properties. So in the situation where um, the cytokine storm has already happened, then the next step of what we could do is we could prevent or we could treat the organ damage, uh, such as the damage in, in the lungs and the heart. So for example, um, for the lungs, we have uh, nimpidinib. Uh, this is a medication being used uh, for uh, pulmonary fibrosis. It is a protein kinase inhibitor. Um, there is a thalidomide. Uh, there are also um, traditional Chinese medicine which seek to either prevent or treat lung damage with the cytokine storm. Also protection of the heart. Um, there's, uh, th there are trials looking at uh, using medications very similar to heart attack medications, uh, aspirin, cl clopidogrel, uh, rivaroxaban, pelvostatin, so on and so forth, to try to protect the heart um, in the w with the COVID-19 infection. So, like, I hope that would give you an idea and also a framework from which uh, we would look at all the different treatments for COVID-19. Now let's take a look at uh, that famous, or again, like uh, shall we say, infamous trial looking at hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. This trial has garnered a lot of uh, media attention, and I thought it would be a good idea to, to, to talk about it. So this study is uh, conducted by a group of researchers based in France, led by Dr. Raoul. Um, the, the, the trial is called the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin as a treatment of COVID-19 results of an open-labeled, non-randomized clinical trial. What are the inclusion criteria who, who are included in that trial? Well, patients would have to have a confirmed COVID-19 uh, diagnosis, but, uh, but they're not particularly sick. Like, uh, so um, they don't have to be in ICU before they're included, uh, for example, and age uh, older than 12 years. And what are, what, what's the treatment? What is the intervention? Well, they approached patients uh, to see whether they wanted to participate in that trial. And those who agreed to participate, they received a hydroxychloroquine 200 milligrams three times a day. Some patients who agreed to participate it, um, also received uh, azithromycin in addition to hydroxychloroquine. Uh, but the intention really is, is to prevent bacterial, a secondary bacterial infection. Like uh, we know that uh, for, for people with uh, influen influenza, for example, that they're at risk of, uh, of having like a bacterial infection on top of the, the, the flu. And so in order to prevent patients who got COVID-19 from getting that same secondary bacterial infection, some patients also received azithromycin. That was the intent um, of, uh, of giving the azithromycin. Now, there are also patients who, who were approached but did not agree to participate in this study. Well, they did not get the intervention. However, they were still included in the study as a control group. And some patients from another hospital were also included as a, as a control group. Now, 
in terms of the primary endpoint, what they're looking at uh, for this study, they're looking at virological clearance at day six post inclusion. What that means is that day six, how many of the patients where um, they could not detect a virus uh, in them anymore. And now let's look at the results. Well, there are 42 patients enrolled in that study. Uh, 26 of them received treatment. 16 of them didn't really want to be in that study, so they were uh, uh, controlled. Their control group did not receive the treatment. However, when you look at the 26 patients who received treatment, six of them were lost to follow up, i.e., like um, they weren't sure like uh, about their their viral virological uh, and uh, clearance at day six. It, they didn't measure these uh, six patients. And what happened to these six patients? Um, three of them went to ICU, one died, one got nausea from hydroxychloroquine and didn't really want to continue taking it, and one decided to leave the hospital and they could not uh, follow them up. When you look at these six patients, um, you could see that at least four of them has se severe outcomes here, uh, but these six patients were not included in the study results and were, uh, were categorized as lost to follow up. So the results were based on 20 treated patients. Among them, six also received azithromycin. The rest of them, uh, the 14 of them, received just hydroxychloroquine. And then 16 of them were controlled, did not receive either hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin. So we basically have three groups here. The first group received hydroxychloroquine, and there are 14 patients. Six received both hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and 16 patients received neither. Now let's look at the results. And as you could see, let's take a look at the green line. This is the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin combination. These are the six patients. And these six patients, uh, you could see that um, the studies show that uh, by day five, none of them already have a virus uh, detectable. When you look at the hydroxychloroquine only group, this is the blue line with the, uh, with the squares. You could see that there are still good uh, um, a, a clearance of the virus outside of the body and there is a smaller um, a percentage of patients still have the, um, the, the, the virus in their body compared to the control group. The control group is the, is the black line with the diamond uh, uh, there and as you can see there are more uh, larger proportion of people who still have virus at, on day six. And with that, the authors conclude that uh, hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin um, is a promising treatment uh, for COVID-19. However, like the important thing to bear in mind is that those six patients were not included in these uh, graphs. And one wonders if those six patients who we know have, um, have uh, a serious outcome, um, at least four out of those six have serious outcome, if they're included, then now this, this graph might look very different. So based on these results, the authors concluded that uh, we show here that hydroxychloroquine is efficient in clearing viral nasopharyngeal caries of SARS-CoV-2 in, in, uh, in COVID-19 patients in only three to six days in most patients. They also commented on the synergistic effect of the combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin based on um, those six patients. Now, uh, Dr. David Yearling, the head of clinical pharmacology and toxicology at uh, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Hospital in Toronto, commented on this study. He says the study had so many holes that you could drive a truck through it. Um, I, I agree um, with him that uh, this study has many methodological issues and as such does not constitute a strong evidence um, to support the, the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. Um, I, I'm not saying that hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin are ineffective, um, but you just can't uh, say that they're effective based on this study. Um, uh, more study, more confirmation uh, evidence uh, are, is needed uh, before we could make that claim that they are uh, if effective. Uh, interestingly enough, the same group of researchers uh, published a subsequent study with uh, 80 patients um, uh, using the same, same, same drug uh, as the follow-up study uh, but that study did not have a control group. Um, there's also um, another study. Now, this is a randomized controlled study uh, based in China. Uh, also look, looked at hydroxychloroquine and, uh, and, and also uh, found positive results. So that um, the hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin com combination, um, it, it still holds promise. And uh, we, 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 we look with interest in, uh, in seeing uh, further trials with these, uh, with these two medications.
It is also very important to bear in mind that uh, hydroxychloroquine and or, or chloroquine has significant side effects as well. So um, there, if they are being used indiscriminately, um, there could be uh, significant side effects uh, that happens as well. And finally, with az azithromycin, um, the indiscriminate use of antibiotics promotes uh, um, uh, resistance, bacterial re resistance, which is, uh, which is uh, something that we should avoid. So in conclusion, uh, we talked about uh, the anatomy of SARS-CoV-2, the virus itself, and its process of infection, and, uh, and talked about the different potential targets for which we could develop treatments for. We talked about some of the clinical trials for, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, drug treatment right now that are ongoing. Uh, we, uh, we, we presented them uh, following the process of inf uh, infection, those five steps. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the clinical trial that had uh, garnered a lot of uh, publicity uh, with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin, and um, so we, we, we commented on that. And so finally, like I, I really hope that we could all be involved in the quest to find treatments for COVID-19 and also monitor its impact on our healthcare system. Like I hope that this sparks your interest in this area, and I hope that we could all work together to, to try to um, to try to uh, improve the situation so thank you thank you for listening and um, take care and stay healthy